everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we have Dr. Erica Elliott and she is going to be talking about her book. Uh, can you hold up your book? Certainly. Dr. Elliott, yes. Uh, Medicine and Miracles in the High Desert, My Life Among the Navajo People. So welcome. Thank you. So um, I wanted to first talk about your experience. You spent two, several how many years in total with the Navajo people? Two and a half. Two and a half. Oh, and then I came back as a doctor and spent another two years as a medical doctor. Okay. Okay. Got it. So you spent a total of four and a half years with, yeah. um, with the Navajo people. Is that the right thing to say, the Navajo people? Uh, I, I use that word because that's the way we talked in 50 years ago. Now it's more respectful to say the Diné. But I, I'm sort of, when I talk yeah. about the book, I'm reliving that time. And so I use the words that everybody used, even the Navajo people at that time. But, but now, talking about our present time, it's much more uh, respectful to say the Diné. That means the people. Diné. Diné. D-I-N-E. Diné. Diné. Okay, good. All right. So let's talk about your time with the Diné. And did I pronounce it correctly? Yes. Close enough. Okay. <laughs> All right. And um, so you started off as a teacher and I wanted to talk about one of the things um, that's so interesting is the cross-cultural understanding or maybe even misunderstandings that you had initially yeah. and what you learned throughout your time there. Um, and you, it started off as a teacher and you have this beautiful opening passage describing your experience as a teacher and there's so many misunderstandings that you were able to navigate luckily through someone who was there who was, uh, was part of the Diné. Um, can you share with us the story of your first experiences and kind of how you learned that there was more leaning in that would be helpful to actually connect with the people that you were teaching? Okay. So I, after graduating from college, I looked into the trade journals for teaching positions. And I saw one in the middle of nowhere for a boarding school for, I'm going to say Navajo because that's what the term we used back then. The Navajo people, a boarding school in Chinle in the Southwest in the middle of nowhere. And some little voice, some inner compass said that's where I should go. And my friends thought I was crazy. Why would I do a thing like that? And uh, even my family thought I was crazy doing that. Because you're from and, New England originally. Yeah, New England. Yeah. And, and I've been raised much of my life in Europe. And uh, I started school in England. I graduated from high school in Germany. My mother was Swiss. So I was, I was used to different cultures, but this was really different. And so I, I went out there and... Uh, uh, they, they had been looking for a school teacher for a long time. They couldn't fill the slot. Nobody wanted to be out there. Mm. And so these old teachers, when they saw me, they said, what's, what's a, young, a young, cute thing like you doing out here? Like, how silly for you to choose this job. Basically, they came because they couldn't find jobs elsewhere. And they're basically waiting to retire. They were all quote old from my view I was 23 and they were like 55 60 and seemed really bored and when I got there I got no orientation about the Diné nothing and I knew nothing they seemed to know nothing it was pretty shocking uh and so uh, in my ignorance, I made one cultural mistake after another, having no idea what I was doing, all the th things that I was doing wrong. Like I stood in front of the class the first day, said, um, good morning, children. My name is Miss Elliot. And nobody looked at me. And they looked down. And um, so I said, I thought, wow, there must be a hearing problem. And so I said it louder. Nobody looked at me. <laughs> I made a total fool out of myself. And I was very insecure. This is my first teaching job. I was just out of college. I thought, I must be doing something wrong here. And um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't understand what, what was going on. So I got my 
my uh, seat charting and I, I pointed to a boy, I, I said, you must be Billy Begay. And he cringed like I had shot him with a dart. I, and I thought, wow, why is he acting like that? And then, um, and, uh, then I pointed to somebody else and they wouldn't answer me. And so I, I just about gave up. I didn't know what in the world was going on. So then I started reading the silly Dick and Jane book about like white kids and suburban neighborhoods and stuff. It was so <laughs> irrelevant. But what, what was I to do? I didn't know what to do. They right. weren't talking to me. So I, I started uh, reading this stupid Dick and Jane book. And then uh, the girl in the front row, she leaned over and spit on the floor. And I, I was just like, oh my God, what just happened? And, and I looked on the seating chart and I said, e Evelyn Sussie, you need, you need to clean that up. And she didn't budge. She, she put her head down even more and all this black hair came over the desk. So her he head, her face was completely hidden and she, she wouldn't budge. And so I ended up cleaning it up with a paper towel. I was squat on the floor and I thought, oh my God, this is chewing tobacco juice. I go, oh my God, this is so strange. The whole thing is so strange. So I cleaned it up and, um, and then I went on reading this meaningless Dick and Jane thing. And it, it went from bad to worse. And when, when I walked around town, nobody looked at me, nobody smiled at me. And they talked in such a way, it was so guttural. It sounded like they were all mad at each other. Mm. And I didn't know it was just their language. That's, that's the way it sounds. And, uh, and so I, uh, and the landscape looked so barren. The town looked like it was from another era. I just thought, oh my God, what am I doing here? And the teachers, they were so bored. They're just waiting to retire. They didn't even seem like they liked the children at all. They didn't know anything about them. And so I called my father and I said, Dad, I made a really big mistake. You are right. I mean, I, I, I shouldn't have come out here. They, the kids don't like me. They don't talk to me. Nobody talks to me in town. The town's really ugly. There's no grass or anything and um, no trees. And um, so I'm, I'm going to come home. And he said, you know, you, you've only been there six days. You can't really judge a person or a place or land in six days. Why don't you stay for three months? And I said, well, okay, but I know I'm still going to want to go home. I don't think anything's going to change. So then it was so amazing what happened. I, my teacher aide was Navajo. And she was familiar with the white world and the Navajo world because her father was in the military and they traveled all over. So she spoke fluent English without an accent and she knew the traditional Navajo world. And these kids were very traditional. They were in a boarding school. That meant they came from very remote areas. They weren't around white people very much. Mm. And, and so I, I was saying to her, she was really quiet and shy also. And I was saying, Donna, I don't know what to do. These kids won't talk to me. I, I, I don't know how to teach. Well, what am I doing wrong? And she just listened and listened. And I kept saying all the things that were frustrating. And then she, in a very quiet voice, she said something that changed my life. She said very softly, would you like to learn about my people? Hmm. I said, yes, nobody has told me anything about the Navajo people. I don't know anything. And she said, well, let's talk about, about your first day in class. And she, what she told me was like totally reframing my interpretation. My interpretation was completely off. I thought these kids didn't like me. I thought maybe something was wrong or something. She said they didn't look at me because they were showing respect. They, she said that was a very respectful thing to do. You're a new teacher. And I said, well, why, why didn't they talk to me? She said, most of them don't speak English. 
And I said, how, how is that possible? They're in the fourth grade and they don't speak English. And she said, well, first of all, many of them have to stay home uh, to herd the sheep, to help the mothers with the babies and so forth. And so they miss out lots of school. And also, she said, they, they can't relate to the teaching materials. Mm. And the teachers don't know anything about them. And they're not really motivated to learn. They don't really see how this is going to help them. And she said, <clears throat> would you like me to teach you a few words of Navajo? And I said, yes. And this also was life changing. So she wrote on the blackboard a few words and they were so strange and the sounds were so weird. And I, I said, I, I'm determined to learn some words. And she said, well, this is the hardest language. It was the code that the code talkers use her, her father was a very famous code talker, Carl Gorman, but she was so modest. She, I had to find that out later. He's very famous. Mm. And she, he said that, she said that was a code that was never broken. It wasn't a code. It was just their language. And I said, well, I'm going to learn it somehow. And, and so she taught me how to say a few sentences. And I went home and in my dumpy little apartment and I practiced over and over and over in front of the mirror. And in those days, there was no dictionary or anything. You had to do it by ear. It was so hard. And I'm a, I'm a linguist. I speak multiple languages mm. from having been raised all over. But this was like nothing. This made German seem like nothing. This was so hard. These weird sounds like like and um wow yeah 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 my my sister speaks fluent chinese and she said there's a lot of similarities mm. in, because it's a tonal language and if you don't hold the vowel long enough or stop too short or, or cut it off too long you, you're you're gonna say something completely different like in english like a vowel has about two ways to say it a uh, and a for example in Denebizad, the Navajo language, there's about 15 different ways you could say a vowel. And so it was incredibly challenging mm. for me. So the next day, I went into the classroom and everybody's head was looking down. And this is what I said. I, well, I, I said, that was good morning children my name is erica elliott and what's your name and where do you come from and all the children looked up at the same time and made eye contact with me and then the girls put their hands in front of their mouth and started giggling then the whole class started giggling and they raised their hands and they talked to navajo to me and they were telling me their names and mm. that was the beginning of a complete love affair mm. for the children. And th that's when the boldest boy in the class, Billy Begay, he, he was the one who knew the most English and he was the least shy. He came up to my desk and said in heavily accented Navajo, he said, Elliot, they couldn't say Miss Elliot. That was too hard. They yeah. it's L -L -T, E L L T Elliot. Take me home. I said, hey, take you home? And he said, oh, that means yes in Navajo. And I, I said, you mean, uh, you mean uh, check you out of the boarding school? He said, oh, uh, you mean this weekend? Oh, and, and you mean I take you to your parents' house in the canyon? Oh, so that's what I did. I did all the paperwork. I checked him out. We had the time. I had the time of my life. I didn't understand a word they were saying. Nobody spoke English. It was in the most beautiful place I've ever seen in my life, Canyon de Chez. Have you ever been there? Mm -mm. It's gorgeous. It's so magical. And here I thought I was in a wasteland. I told my father how ugly it was. This is the most beautiful thing. My God, if I had not listened to my father, I would have missed out the most profound experience of my life and um anyway so 
so um, I, I, I was taken in and they talked to me even though I had no idea what they're saying. They smiled at me. They weren't shy with me. And I went bareback horseback riding with the boys and stuff. And when we came back, we, we, I decided to, to hell with that Dick and Jane stuff. That was so stupid having these Navajo kids read about these white kids sledding down a hill and then going to their white picket fence. So we made our own curriculum. And so this was the first day we made our own curriculum. I asked them to write about my time with Billy Begay because when I came back on Monday, the entire boarding school knew every detail about my visit to Billy Begay. And so they, I said, write one sentence and then draw a picture. So some put one word, some three words, some you could read it, some was illegible. But one of the kids did this beautiful picture of the canyon with a horse racing at the bottom of the canyon and a white girl on the horse clinging for dear life to the mane with the ponytail sticking straight out and underneath it said, my teacher, T-E-E-C-H-I-R. And so that was the beginning that every weekend a different student asked me to take them home. Mm. So that's when I was sort of adopted by the tribe. And mm. I started really learning Navajo. I could mm. carry on a conversation. You know, how many sheep do you have? Where do you live? I, I could ask all that. Ultimately, what this turned out is that um, the principal of boarding school had never seen anything like this before. And so he talked to the officials in Washington, and they ended up choosing my classroom as a model, pilot model for bilingual bicultural education, which was new 50 years ago. And the BBC came with a French crew, and they, they, they had the time of their life. That the is, yeah, that's yeah. great. So that's a great story. And um, show your book, because in the next segment, I wanted to talk about the additional risks and courage that you took when you were there. Um, we've been talking to Do Dr. Eric Elliott, uh, Erica Elliott about her book, um, Medicine and Miracles in the High Desert, and um, the importance of having a cross-cultural understanding and how her world shifted, moved, your, your perspective completely changed. Um, and it was mostly because you had, I think, the risk incurred, like you were willing to like, get into a car and drive to some kid's house and do a hike for three miles and, and do all these kinds of experiences. So in the next segment, I wanted to talk about these incredible experiences that, and things that you witnessed when you went on these weekend trips. Um, thank you so much. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.